Hello everyone, today we're going to attempt something kind of difficult, which is to give an overall account of Walter Benjamin's philosophy of art. You'll notice there's a lot out there breaking down the work of art essay, but almost nothing on how that essay is to be situated in Benjamin's oeuvre. What if it turns out that in terms of his overall account of art, the work of art essay, the most famous piece by Benjamin, ends up being something of an aberration and even a sacrifice of art compared to his more considered reflections in the earliest and latest period. We're not going to get quite to the later Benjamin today, and so the subtitle of this lecture, From the Task of the Critic to the Work of Art Essay. Walter Benjamin's dates are 1892 to 1940. He was a German-Jewish philosopher, cultural critic, and essayist. Notice how the wiki puts philosopher first. Of course, the big question with Benjamin and his reception is, is he more of a cultural critic and essayist or more of a philosopher? In the reading we'll give today, Benjamin's philosophy of art is so deeply embedded in the Western tradition of meditation on art we've studied in this course, and so original in regards to it, that we are hard pressed to find anything since Benjamin which is genuinely novel. In this sense, he is perhaps the terminus ante quem, or latest possible date for something, in this case for the Western philosophy of art as a whole. As the wiki states, Benjamin was an eclectic thinker, combining elements of German idealism, romanticism, Western Marxism, and Jewish mysticism, he made enduring and influential contributions to aesthetic theory, literary criticism, and the school of thought known as historical materialism. More on that in a moment. He was often associated with the Frankfurt School, especially in his later years, although really on its fringes, and also maintained formative friendships with thinkers such as the playwright Bertolt Brecht and the Kabbalist scholar Gershom Scholem. Among his best known works are the essays The Task of the Translator, the work of art in the age of mechanical reproduction and theses on the philosophy of history. His major work as a literary critic included essays on Baudelaire, Goethe, Kafka, Krauss, Leskov, Proust, Walser, and translation theory. In 1940, at the age of 48, Benjamin tragically committed suicide on the French-Spanish border while attempting to escape from the invading Wehrmacht. Though popular acclaim eluded him during his life, the decades following his death won his work posthumous renown. There's a wonderful 1960s lecture by Hannah M. Rent on the life and thought in Benjamin, which you can rent on Prime, and I would recommend it for this unit. So the one piece that is most often studied of Benjamin's in a philosophy of art class is the work of art essay. Its main questions, how do we create a theory of art that is neither capitalist or fascist or communist, while at the same time being able to formulate revolutionary demands in the politics of art. The essay sets out from the observation that in principle, the work of art has always been reproducible. However, the technologies of reproduction have changed drastically. Now we have a total dominance of mechanical reproduction. The question is, how does this change art itself? In order to get to these questions and be able to formulate and understand Benjamin's answers to them, we need to understand where Benjamin is coming from and what he is liquefying in this essay. And for that, we need the early Benjamin. The fact that most courses in the philosophy of art exclusively focus on the work of art essay creates an unfortunate situation of notoriety for his thought, coupled with an almost complete ignorance of his basic analyses in the philosophy of art aesthetics. Why are Benjamin's other writings almost never studied except in graduate programs? Well, probably because people have trouble understanding them. In place of such understanding and close reading, what gets circulated are platitudes and non-issues, such as whether Benjamin was even a philosopher and not merely a cultural critic. What we need to really understand and situate the work of art essay is a basic introduction to Benjamin's philosophy of art across its three periods, early, middle, and late. Here, I'll be covering the early Benjamin's philosophy of art and then fast forwarding to 1935, leaving the later period untouched except in schematic outline. I'm not a Benjamin scholar, so for this monumental task, I'll be utilizing Rainer Rocklitz's still unsurpassed and probably unsurpassable study, The Disenchantment of Art, The Philosophy of Walter Benjamin, first published in French in 1992 and translated into English in 1996. Most of the texts that he covers are quite difficult even for specialists, and certainly couldn't be covered in detail in a course like this. Rather, the close study of Benjamin's philosophy of art would be the work of a graduate seminar. My goal here will be to try to condense the main lines of argumentation in Benjamin's early and middle period thinking about art into all the essential need-to-know theses and arguments and limiting it to about an hour and a half. While I will try to stay introductory, this lecture may at times go over your head if you missed several earlier lectures in this course, such as especially those on Schelling, Hegel, Goethe, Schlegel, and Nietzsche, a basic knowledge of which needs to be assumed here to really get where Benjamin is coming from and where he's going. 
The benefit of this synoptic approach and summarizing of Rocklitz's argument will be that for those who follow this lecture, in a very short period of time, he'll acquire a basic understanding of the terrain of Benjamin's thinking about art, and thus become one of those few readers able to approach the work of art essay in its intellectual context in Benjamin's oeuvre, as well as in the history of philosophy of art, a rather rare thing to be attempted if you poke around on YouTube and the interwebs on these topics. According to Rochlitz, among great 20th century philosophers, only Ludwig Wittgenstein has had a comparable destiny and remains, like Benjamin, a contemporary through and through. By the late 1990s, studies that managed to grasp the logic behind this philosopher's system of thought have been quite rare. However, he was a quite systematic philosopher, and so a systematic approach to him is valuable, although difficult. Benjamin's progeny could not have been more diverse. Literary criticism and art criticism refer to his writings all the time. Adorno's work is a ceaseless commentary on him. Derrida and Lyotard and even Foucault refer to him often, as do Habermas and Paul Ricoeur. Modernists and postmodernists claim him as their own. Advocates and detractors of the Enlightenment divide up his inheritance. And his most committed exegetes place his thinking on the same level as that of the most discussed living philosophers. The only philosopher of comparable scope and influence since Benjamin and the time of writing this book in the late 90s has been Giorgio Agamben. In order to understand how to approach Benjamin, we have to begin at the beginning and understand that his philosophy in the first instance is a philosophy of language, even that he participated in the linguistic turn in philosophy, although from a very different perspective than the godfathers of analytic philosophy like Wittgenstein or Russell. In fact, both Benjamin and Wittgenstein share the ambition of eliminating the inexpressible in language. That is the attempt to make everything effable and sayable in its truth and in linguistic form. However, what exactly the elimination of the ineffable or the inexpressible in language looks like will be quite different in Benjamin or in Wittgenstein, as we'll see in a minute. We can begin by dividing Benjaminian aesthetics into three periods, theological, political, and messianic. The first period of Benjamin's thinking defined by theological aesthetics begins from his conception of language as a faculty for naming and of absolute expression as communication not between men but with God. Remember how in the Garden of Eden myth, after creating all things and man in six days, utilizing only the word, God allows Adam to name what has been created, thus creating a bifurcation between the word of God as the original creation and the naming of all things in creation as a kind of second creating in which Adam attempts through names to understand the essence of things as images of creation and their ineffable source in the divine word. From this conception of language as a faculty for naming, and a communication between man and God, the name and the word, Benjamin will attempt to elaborate a theory of art. From the time of man's entry into history or his expulsion from paradise, according to this biblical myth, art has conserved in a privileged manner the Adamic power of naming. So when we ask what the origin and function of art is in the context of this theological aesthetics, Benjamin answers mythically that its origin is Adamic naming and its function is to restore the divine word to things through the name. This is where Benjamin's philosophy of art or aesthetics begins, that is, in an attempt to correct the aesthetic tradition and to bring out its theological, in this case Judaic, underpinnings. And it is from this perspective that he will seek to re-establish the unrecognized meaning of Romantic criticism and to re-situate the Christian Romantics in the context of Biblical tradition and Judaic Messianism. Also in this period, Benjamin closely engages Johann Goethe, especially the later works that seem almost to reject myth, otherwise so close to Goethe. And lastly, in this period, he'll attempt a second doctoral thesis or habilitation shrift on the Baroque concept of allegory. In everything he does during this first theological aesthetic phase, he's trying to unearth the forgotten flip side of the classical aesthetics tradition and to bring marginalized or esoteric theories back into conversation with Western aesthetics from Plato to Kant and beyond. In a way, he's uncovering what he considers the deeper roots and the theological meaning of language, history, and art. This first period, although radical and very often mystical or esoteric, is really quite traditional. And throughout it, Benjamin seems to be preparing himself with a great deal of reservation for a possible career as a university professor, something he dreaded. The second period of Benjamin's philosophy of art or aesthetics, after his failure to acquire his academic credential and subsequent career as a journalist and freelance writer, can be defined as the period of his political aesthetics. Here we find Benjamin's political commitment and discovery of the European avant-garde, Dadaism, Surrealism, Photography and Russian cinema. Here Benjamin attempts to place the force of his criticism 
in the service of social revolution, to the point even of sacrificing, as in the work of art essay, the very autonomy of art. During this period, drawing on surrealism, he also elaborates a series of models for redeeming the integrity of human forces in the face of historical action. He is seeking for a creative intoxication, yet a sober one with total presence of mind that could assure humanity mastery over history and control of a technology that, without such a redemption, is in danger of turning against humanity. During the second period, as we'll see, while continuing to develop fundamental aesthetic theories and flesh out a philosophy of art in various registers and domains, at the same time, Benjamin almost willfully sacrifices art on the altar of politics at times nihilistically turning against many of his own most cherished premises and beliefs and analyses from his earlier period. As we'll see by the end of this lecture, this second period of political aesthetics could be understood as an act of Abrahamic sacrifice on Benjamin's part. And what it leads to directly after the work of art essay is Benjamin's third period or messianic aesthetics. This third period tends to restore aesthetic autonomy or the autonomy of the work of art as well as its theological foundation. Beginning with the storyteller essay, Benjamin no longer accepts the liquidation of traditional elements in the work of art under the conditions of mechanical reproduction. Finally, Benjamin's last text, The Theses on the Philosophy of History, reveals the deepest ethical and political character of his strategy as an art critic. That is, to brush history against the grain, to re-establish concealed or forgotten meanings, and to attempt to save a threatened past and make heard the stifled voices of history without which there can be no redeemed humanity. While Benjamin is not a fully systematic philosopher, and while there is no total unity across his three phases of thought, but there he often ruptures one-way streets and dead ends, at the same time there is a remarkable continuity of aesthetic experience and of aesthetic theory, which enable a close reader and generous interpreter like Rainer Rocklitz to make sense of all three periods of Benjamin's philosophy of art, in terms of the evolution of several fixed premises, as well as the unsettling implied by new paths of thought and moments of interruption, chiasmic intertwining and reversal. It is not so much the orientation of Benjamin's thought that changes across its three phases, an orientation defined by two terms here, hermeneutics and messianism, but rather the grounding of his thought in key disciplines of philosophy that accounts for both the contradictions and paradoxical coherences across his three phases. The earliest phase of his thought being grounded in the philosophy of language, the middle phase in a messianic political theory, and the final phase in a philosophy of history. Across all three phases, Benjamin's meditations on language, art, literature, and history set out from romantic aesthetics. Especially Kant's third critique studied in this course, the Italian Giam Battista Vico, a figure I wish we had time to study in more detail, the Hermetic philosophy of Jakob Bohme, the German philosophy of language tradition such as Hamann, Herder, and Humboldt, as well as the Romantic figures more familiar to us, Schlegel, Novalis, and Hödelin. Throughout, Benjamin's philosophical orientation is defined by mysticism and hermeneutics. On the one hand, a messianic mysticism, and on the other, a theory of interpretation which in Benjamin bears close comparison to Talmudic rabbinical interpretation of the Torah or Tanakh, but is implied instead to the European and specifically German aesthetic tradition. Introducing the topic of messianism in Benjamin, we can note that for him, history is an ongoing process of ruptures and breaks rather than of continuities with tradition. The angel of history looks upon the past from the future as one long catastrophe. The historical moment and work of art most worth studying for Benjamin is thus a liberating interruption or catastrophe in the fatal course of things. It is this excluded part of history that carries the messianic hope of a reversal. The movement of historical progress is actually a succession of catastrophes. Always like in the biblical myth, moving from a fullness of meaning, which is impure because of its mythical character, to a poverty of meaning defined by increasing levels of abstraction. The abstraction of meaning could be understood in terms of the platonic idea, supersensible or spiritual dimension of history, winning out over the creative body, or the poverty of meaning could be understood as the reification of a mechanically produced commodity. In both the early and the middle phase, Benjamin seeks to mark the pauses where the liberating genius of humanity manifests itself while pointing towards its decisive liberation. This idea across Benjamin of rescuing a liberating act of signification forgotten or disregarded by official tradition is perhaps the one thing that remains constant. And in this project for Benjamin, art has a specific privilege and a place, but only to the extent that the enchantment of its appearance 
is dominated by the disenchantment proper to knowledge. In other words, art is an exemplary, liberating act of signification, but one not to be worshipped merely in the enchantment of its appearances. And so art's privilege in Benjamin, as a moment in the messianic movement of history, is not absolute but is checked, as we'll see, by philosophy and by criticism. Now I think we can already see, just from the difficulties of these introductory remarks, why it is constantly debated whether Benjamin is a philosopher or an essayist. For many readers, in France perhaps more than elsewhere, Benjamin is seen as a writer first and a philosopher second. He himself had the ambition of being considered the foremost critic of German literature. In the eyes of Adorno and Scholem, however, he was primarily a philosopher. Rocklitz comments here, undoubtedly there is no total philosophical system in Walter Benjamin. He is in the most elevated sense of a term that is sometimes used to discredit him, an essayist. But he is not an essayist in the manner of Michel de Montaigne. The scientific imperative is not lacking in his essays. He conducts concrete research from a philosophical perspective, and he has created or rethought numerous concepts that are part of philosophical debates today, the most remembered Benjaminian concepts being truth content versus subject matter, symbol versus allegory, aura and mechanical reproduction, cult value versus exhibition value, and dialectical image and remembrance. Rochlitz asks, what can such a schema of concepts, all oriented by the theme of messianic redemption, signify for a reader formed in other schools? That of analytic philosophy, for example. Schools that may not share the historical, philosophical, and aesthetic passions of the European continent. That reader will have a tendency to think that Benjamin is not a philosopher, in the strict sense of the term. For anyone who actually reads Benjamin carefully, in historical, philosophical, and aesthetic context, in terms of the traditions of European philosophy, the idea that Benjamin is not strictly speaking a philosopher is pretty ludicrous. Nevertheless, any rereading of Benjamin today must respond to these analytic imperatives. I won't be bringing Benjamin into dialogue too much with analytic philosophy here, but if you're interested in this, Rochlitz does a pretty good job putting many of Benjamin's theses firmly on the map of the analytic tradition in philosophy of art, from Wittgenstein through Arthur Danto to Nelson Goodman while at the same time giving pretty clear critical appraisals of where Benjamin was a victim to certain conceptual confusions. So let's look again at the overall trajectory of Benjamin's philosophy of art, beginning with his philosophies of language and history. To begin to read Benjamin properly, one could not avoid taking seriously on language as such and on the language of man, 1916, as well as on the program of coming philosophy, 1918. For it is here that the conceptual choices that will determine the totality of his positions and interests are laid out. Accordingly, to understand Benjamin's interest both in art theory and in the philosophy of history, we need to begin with his philosophy of language, as well as to accept the fact from the get-go that this philosophy has no scientific status. Rather, it is a myth through which the young philosopher attempted to define his task as a thinker, i.e. the biblical myth of the fall. Rocklitz notes here helpfully that at a time when Ferdinand de Saussure and others were elaborating a scientific linguistics, Benjamin seems to be returning purely and simply to pre-modern, metaphysical, and mystical conceptions of the Book of the World, in which everything speaks to us. And this links Benjamin from the beginning to the end to the symbolist context that we studied last week. Throughout his philosophy of language, Benjamin's main intention is to rescue language from any instrumentalist conception. The function of language is less designation and communication than evocation in the Mallarmean sense, a pure name or the suggestion that leads to a pure name. In order to understand this weird conception of language, we have to understand, first of all, that for Benjamin, language is not particular to man. Everything in creation is language, and man's language is only a particular, albeit a privileged form, one mode of language as such. Things and beings in nature communicate themselves to man. In contrast, in naming the mental being, man communicates himself to God. In short, Benjamin needs God to save human language from an instrumental conception of language, which he understands always dismissively as the bourgeois conception of language. This may seem strange to our ears, but it's a basic point in Jewish, Christian, and Islamic theology. First there is the Word of God, then the revealed religion, and only subsequently the revealing or concealing functions of art, philosophy, or science and criticism, etc. For Benjamin, quote, the highest mental region of religion is, in the concept of revelation, at the same time the only one that does not know the inexpressible. Only in religious revelation do we transcend ineffability, get beyond the need for negative theology, and enter into the very nature of the world as God's expressive creation. 
the Word of God is addressed in the name and expresses itself as revelation, such as the Torah, the New Testament, or the Quran. In this, however, notice is given that only the highest mental being, as it appears in religion, rests solely on man and on the language in him. So quite traditionally, the scriptures of revealed religion are primary. They are the language or naming function of man that gets closest to the Word of God. In contrast to this, all art, not excluding poetry, does not rest on the ultimate essence of the language mind, but on a language mind confined to things, even if in consummate beauty. So remember our chicken and egg discussion from other romantics in this course, what came first, art, philosophy, or religion? For Benjamin, clearly religion. Above all, revealed religion, the word of God rendered into the naming language of man. Art comes next as language directed to things in their manifestation or beauty. Roquelet's comments here, this hierarchy of being, established on the basis of the relation to language, elucidates the internal economy of Benjamin's oeuvre. What it aspires to, without being able to attain it, is a fusion of philosophical and religious discourse in the perfect doctrine that knows nothing of the inexpressible. In contrast, art, poetry included, is situated at a lower level whose language is impure and still acquainted with the inexpressible through the thingness of its language. Even lower on the chain of being, the languages of things are imperfect and mute. Just as man in general saves things that are in themselves mute by naming them and thus including them in creation, the philosopher, as Benjamin conceives it, has the task of saving the mental being of art and poetry by stripping away their thingness and bringing them back to the bosom of pure language. This is what the infinite work of the critic and the translator consists in. Beginning from the premise that, quote, all human language is only a reflection of the word in name, and that name is no closer to the word than knowledge to creation, Benjamin unfolds a conception of the divine word which is very close to Kant's idea of the noumenal. The infinity of all human language, of all appearance in language, always remains limited and analytic in nature in comparison to the absolutely unlimited and creative infinity of the divine word. Therefore, language both creates and is finished creation. It is word and name. In God, the name creates because it is the word, and God's word is knowledge because it is the name. However, the absolute relation of name to knowledge exists only in God, what the German romantics would call divine or intellectual intuition. Only in God is the name inwardly identical to the creating word, the pure medium of knowledge. To understand the complexities here, I can look to this handy dandy chart. God, the most perfect language or word, is contrasted to man who is perfecting language through the name. The arts of man are important, but less perfect than man's originary relation to the word through the name. The arca art for Benjamin, as for other philosophers who studied his poetry, close to the naming and to art, while the plastic arts, sculpture as well as music, are closer to the language of things. Roglitz asks, what would Wittgenstein think of all this? And notes that he would probably have a biting rebuttal. The philosophy of language rooted in the function of naming appears as a queer connection of a word with an object. And you really get such a queer connection when the philosopher tries to bring out the relation between the name and the thing by staring at an object in front of him and repeating a name or even the word this innumerable times. For philosophical problems arise when language goes on holiday. And here we may indeed fancy naming to be some remarkable act of mind, as it were the baptism of an object. Such reflections on the Adamic naming function as language on holiday are, however, foreign to Benjamin. For him, the biblical text plays a role analogous to tragic texts or pre-Socratic thought in Nietzsche's philosophy. The Hebrew Bible is a primitive wisdom lost by modernity. And for Benjamin, it makes sense that the theory of language would ultimately be based on a myth and on a revealed religion of the word. We're going to skip over Benjamin's theory of translation and the task of the translator essay. The most important consequences of his theology of the word and the name for aesthetics is that the work of art, like poetry, like philosophy, and like the name, has no auditor or addressee other than God. Art is a creative activity that liberates the language of creation in things, whether through poetry, the plastic arts, or music. This radical position held by the early Benjamin can be summed up in a maxim of Diderot's. If in drawing a picture, one imagines beholders, all is lost. Here, Benjamin draws support for his theology from the modern metaphysics of art for art's sake, which tends to snatch art away from any social function of representation. Quote from Benjamin, in the appreciation of a work of art or an art form, 
consideration of the receiver never proves fruitful. Art posits man's physical and spiritual existence, but in none of its works is it concerned with his response. No poem is intended for the reader, no picture for the beholder, no symphony for the listener. Rochlitz comments here, in denying any communicative function in the work of art, which must necessarily belittle what is essential in it or what communicates itself to God, Benjamin is now aiming at a function of art that stems from the philosophy of history. So having surveyed Benjamin's overall phases and looked so far in more detail at his theological phase and philosophy of language, I'll turn now to a more in-depth account of Benjamin's account of Romantic aesthetics. During this period, he was concerned above all to save Romantic aesthetics from the nationalistic turn and the pan-German ideology during World War I that he saw in the free student movement. Again, Benjaminian aesthetics during this phase is primarily a response to Kant's third critique, specifically in its reception by Jenner Romanticism and Hödelin, and Goethe comes in as a necessary corrective. This period sees Benjamin privileging imminent analysis of the poem or artwork as a means of liberating its truth content. The impetus for the idea of truth content derives from the saying of Novalis, but it ends up being fully realized in the later work of Hödelin and especially Goethe's novel Elective Affinities. The turn to general romanticism, Hödelin and Goethe, involves a fundamental transformation of Kantian aesthetics. However, Benjamin is still seeking, like Kant, to establish the bases on which an aesthetic judgment can be grounded and justified. Remember Kant's judgment of the beautiful, which is subjective and a matter of aesthetic taste, but at the same time universal? For Benjamin, the grounds of calling a work beautiful do not lie in subjective taste, but rather in the aesthetic content of the work itself. His goal here is to confer the rigor of Kant's transcendental foundation for aesthetics not on the judgment of taste, but on the work of art as an isolated unity. Hödelin and Goethe are the most important figures during this period because it's in them that the thrust of the third critique, its basic idea of beauty as a sensible sign of the idea or as an absolute inaccessible to rational knowledge, becomes personal destiny and even, in Hödelin's case, madness. Through his genius, the poet is charged with giving a form to ultimate meaning, to the truth content. In regards to this basic distinction of Western aesthetics of form and content, the beauty of the form and the sublime truth it reveals and conceals, Benjamin is going to argue that in Hödelin and Goethe, the imminence of form and the truth of the work of art coincide, and that the ambition of both these poets is philosophical. Benjamin's aesthetics during this period is organized around Kant's distinction of the beautiful and the sublime. The beautiful as the appearance of supersensible truth is not just pleasurable in a domesticated way, as it was in Kant, but positively intoxicating for these German romantics, often leading them astray and is in need of a disenchantment. This is where the Kantian concept of the sublime comes in, but in a new sense. Remember Kant on the sublime as that which is absolutely great? since it challenges the imagination beyond its limits and forces the human being to discover new rational ideals from within its soul in order to attempt to deal with and comprehend it. The beautiful is intoxicating, but the sublime is sobering. And here Benjamin speaks of the sublime sobriety of the poet. Recall how in Plato's Ion, the poet was a beautiful, airy and winged thing, which can only accomplish great verses when the god drives it out of its senses. In fact, for Benjamin, the best poets are rigorously sober. Their sobriety stands in the sublime beyond any elevation. And working against the German classical and romantic prejudice in favor of the Greeks as the people of beauty, Benjamin asks, is this still the Hellenist life? And his answer is both yes and no. Yes, the Greeks were a people of beauty, but also of the sublime, such as in tragedy. But against the classical and romantic lineage, no, the Greeks have no more special access to the beautiful or to the sublime, because the life of a pure work of art can never be exclusively that of one people. We must look to the work of art itself and what is poeticized in it. And when we do this, we find that beauty and sublimity arise wherever there is great art. Such life is figured in the forms of Greek myth, not only in its forms. For in the last version, which here means the last version of Hödelin's poem, The Poet's Courage, as well as in the last analysis, that is, in the later Hödelin as well as the later Goethe, the Greek element is abolished and cedes its place to another, the so-called Eastern element. Benjamin's point here is that wherever great art happens, the beautiful and its principle of structuration is abolished in favor of a truth content. 
Against Nietzsche's The Birth of Tragedy, however, he argues that in Goethe and Hedelin, this truth content is not primarily Dionysian, nor is it simply Apollonian. Hedelin well formulates the effective principle of the greatest art when he discusses Junonian sobriety. In the letter to Bollendorf, Hudelin had spoke of the Greeks as the people of the fire of heaven, the Dionysian people par excellence, who have to, on account of being burnt by the fire, learn clear conceptual thinking, thereby limiting the intoxicated whims of Zeus from the point of view of the logic of civilization and of marriage defined by the goddess Hera or Juno. Hudelin here speaks of the moderns as the people of clear and sober concepts, for whom the Greek element, the fire of heaven, is what is foreign and who must learn to let a little bit of the blood of Dionysus flow in Apollo's veins. A little bit, but not too much, is Benjamin's point here, otherwise the sublime sobriety of the poet gives way to a romantic or pagan frenzy. For Benjamin, this poetic ethos of Junonian sobriety is what defines Hödelin's and Goethe's greatest achievements in the realm of art, and it is indebted not so much to Dionysian pagan myth, like in the German Romantics, but rather to Judaism and Christian monotheism. The task of aesthetic criticism for Benjamin picking up from the truth content of the greatest works of Hedelin and Goethe is thus to reevaluate and limit what the German Romantics called intellectual intuition. As soon as, through Kant, the history of philosophy had affirmed the possibility of having an intellectual intuition, and at the same time its impossibility in the field of experience, we see multiple manifestations of an almost feverish effort to restore this concept to philosophy as the guarantee of its highest claims. This effort came first from Fichte, Schlegel, Novalis, and Schelling. Such reflection within the medium of art is none other than aesthetic criticism as the Romantics conceived it. Although Fichte was more focused on epistemology, ontology, and ethics, his statements on art conform pretty well to the general Romantic view. In his system of ethics, Fichte writes that art converts the transcendental viewpoint into a common viewpoint. From the transcendental viewpoint, the world is made. From the common viewpoint, it is given. From the aesthetic viewpoint, it is given, but nonetheless in a way that shows how it is made. From this alone, art could be conceived as the privileged locus for the revealing of transcendental ideas and their truth. Rocklet's comments, in making the work of art the medium for reflection par excellence, romantic thinkers avoid the problems inherent in the idealist theory of self-consciousness. In fact, the problems of objective knowledge and intersubjectivity disappear as if with the wave of a magic wand, art. The only gain here is the idea of an imperative for validity inherent in the work of art that must be demonstrated, interpreted, and examined by criticism. And so romantic aesthetics moves from this doctrine of transcendental reflection to the notion of an aesthetic criticism capable of revealing or even participating in art's transcendental functions. We saw this pretty clearly expressed in the aphorisms of Novalis a few weeks ago. And Benjamin gives us a little reminder here. The central operation of the romanticism of Jenna is what Novalis calls romanticizing. In giving the finite an appearance of the infinite, I romanticize it. The true reader must be an extension of the author. He is the higher court that contemplates the thing already prepared by the lower court. The juridical metaphor that here orients aesthetic criticism is striking. The true reader is not merely an extension of the author or beholden to the truth content of the work of art, but rather through transcendental reflection, the higher court itself, which contemplates the products of art and is able to pass judgment on them. For the Romantics, criticism is much less the judgment of a work than the method for completing it in reflection. The Romantics indeed suspended the difference between criticism and poetry, as we saw in Schlegel, and affirmed that poetry cannot be criticized except by poetry. Indeed, a judgment on art that is not itself a work of art has no civil rights in the kingdom of art. What is so peculiar about the point of view of romantic criticism is how it elevates itself as romantic criticism over the work of art. The work of art is even seen as incomplete in terms of its own absolute idea. It needs the critic to complete it. Schlegel thus wrote, to find formulae for individual works that alone allow us to understand them in the most literal sense, that is the substance of art criticism. On the limits of romantic criticism, Benjamin underlines first that the validity of the critical judgments of romanticism have in fact been amply confirmed. They have determined until our own time the fundamental evaluation of historical works, such as those of Dante, Boccaccio, Shakespeare, Cervantes, or Calderon. 
as well as the phenomena contemporary to them, Goethe, we must evaluate the accomplishments of romantic criticism pretty highly, but at the same time note that romantic criticism amounts to little more than a personal and preferential system for evaluating works, that is of appreciating them in their true value and legitimating them in the face of canonical texts from antiquity. Romantic criticism is far from infallible, however. Benjamin underlines that the early romantics failed to discover Hödelin and the superior aesthetic validity of his works any more than did Goethe, who famously dismissed Hödelin's novel Hyperion, probably seeing too much of his own earlier sorrows of young Werther in the young poet. That romantic criticism amounts to little more than personal evaluative preference for specific works and modes of interpreting them from the past indeed leads Schlegel to admit the retrospective character of romantic criticism. Quote, only the classic and eternal pure and simple can be the subject of criticism. What remains is the classic status of works criticized or translated by the romantics. And so positively for Benjamin, romanticism is quote, the last movement that kept tradition alive one more time. However, its efforts were premature for that sphere and age. Its animating drive was, quote, the insanely orgiastic disclosure of all secret sources of the tradition. A disclosure that was to overflow without deviation into all of humanity, as if these new Marsyas were in fact capable of unlocking all the secrets of the past. And this is why Benjamin complements his analysis of the romantic concept of criticism with an insight into the Goethean concept of criticism, since Goethe, more than any author in this period, imposes limits to the quote, insanely orgiastic speculations of the romantics. So rather than simply dismiss the great accomplishments of the general romantics, especially their novels, Benjamin sets out very carefully a transition from romantic aesthetics grounded in the philosophy of reflection to truth content. And here we find three concepts of reflection. First, the philosophical concept of reflection, developed by Fichte and reinterpreted by the Romantics. Second, the aesthetic concept of reflection as the principle of Romantic criticism. And third, the artistic concept of reflection in the sense of a prosaic sobriety opposed to creative ecstasy, especially in Hedlin. This artistic concept of reflection is not absent in the general Romantics in their artworks, but for Benjamin, it is more intensely achieved on the model of prosaic sobriety in Hödling. Finally, in an appendix, Benjamin envisions the limits of romantic criticism by introducing the Goethean idea of the archetypal content of art, from which he draws the idea of art's truth content. In short, Benjamin admires the romantic novel, but finds it too ecstatic and incapable of living up to the idea of sober prose. The idea of poetry, he writes, is prose, and literature at its best can be conceived as an exercise of lucidity and even calculation, the obverse of feeling and enthusiasm. Here, Benjamin introduces his own nuance concerning the disenchantment of art. Under the light of romantic irony, it is only the illusion that falls apart. The kernel of the work of art remains indestructible because it does not rest on ecstasy, which can dissipate, but on an intangible, sober, prosaic figure. The greatest novel from this period, which incarnates this ideal of sober prose, is Goethe's elective affinities. For here we find the mystical constitution of the work of art, but beyond the restricted forms that are beautiful in appearance. At the end, such as in Goethe's elective affinities, or Hödelin's translations of Sophocles, the concept of beauty generally had to disappear from the romantic philosophy of art. And this because beauty, as an object of enjoyment, of pleasure, of taste, was no longer reconcilable with the strict sobriety that in his new conception determined the essence of art. This destruction of illusion, of appearance, of emotion, and of beauty in the name of prose, sobriety, the idea, and the reflection is the formulation of an aesthetics of the sublime, which sacrifices the beautiful appearance in the name of truth. This is the essential concept necessary to understand Benjamin's later theory of the aura and the sacrifice of the aura in the age of mechanical reproduction. Romantic theory speaks only of the form of works and says nothing of their content. The Romantics' concern was not the truth of works, but their truly aesthetic completion. And in this way, Romantic aestheticism was at the origin of their insanely orgiastic disclosure of all secret sources of the tradition. What they did not understand is the moral dimension in which Goethe's life struggled, and which led to the sublime sobriety beyond elevation in works like elective affinities. Benjamin sums up these themes of Goethe versus Romanticism in terms of his notion of a criticism to come. The Romantics recognized only the idea of art as an a priori for their method of critical completion, 
they did not recognize the ideal of art as an a priori for the work's content, what the work is really about. For Goethe, in contrast, there existed a limited plurality of pure contents that composed the ideal of art. And through this conception of the archetypal content of art, Goethe is linked to the Greeks and speaks of invisible archetypes such as the Nine Muses as accessible only to intuition and as ideals which works of art can at best resemble. In Goethe's view, the works that come closest are Greek works which form relative archetypal models. For Goethe, these ideals or archetypes are not created by art but dwell before any production of the work in that sphere where art is not creation but nature. Quote, Goethe's concern in his inquiry into the original phenomena was ultimately to grasp the idea of nature in order to make it an archetype or pure content. This was not nature as an object of science, but true nature. This true archetypal or divine nature only rarely submits itself to the brilliance of manifestation. For the most part, it is submerged and forms the truth content of the work, without which nothing can appear at all. And here we find the threshold of Benjaminian aesthetics in terms of an irresolvable conflict between the romantic idea of art and the Goethean ideal of art. The romantic idea is form and the Goethean ideal is content. The fundamental systematic question of the philosophy of art can thus be formulated as the question of the relation between the idea of art and the ideal of art between beautiful form and sublime content. Benjamin's early inquiry must remain on the threshold of that question. The romantics were no better at solving or even posing this problem than was Goethe. Just as the Romantics lacked the doctrine of content, Goethe lacked the doctrine of form. For him, form was just style. For the Romantics, the great work of art is imminently criticizable. For Goethe, it is uncriticizable, a truth content closed in upon itself. For Goethe, the standpoint of methodical criticism is impossible. For the Romantic critics, it is both possible and necessary, and even contains within its theory the paradox of having more value than the work itself. All this leads Benjamin to his doctrine of positive criticism as a guardian at the gate whose task is to liberate the truth content of the work of art. And this task emerging near the end of Benjamin's first phase, Benjamin's own authorial voice we can say, emerges first in a notice he posted in the journal Angelus Novus. Quote, the criterion of true actuality is absolutely not found among the public. Critic must save works of art, especially new and exciting ones in the present precisely in their truth content, closed in on itself and over and against the receiver. If necessary, the critic must have a total disregard for the public. Rocklitz asks here, how do critics justify such a claim to authority? For if they were to argue for it, they would be within the public's reach. They can therefore only produce imperatives. And this is what Benjamin does. In several essays from this transitional period, Benjamin speaks of the difference between mythic violence, which is merely destructive and divine violence, which undermines myth, liberates truth content, and returns us at the limit to the correspondence of Adamic naming with the divine word. Benjamin is deeply aware a formulation of a concept of divine violence is going to invariably meet with harsh criticism. What he has in mind is not religiously sanctioned warfare or the putting to death or anything that would violate the many commandments of Judaism, rather something like the violence inherent in any act of authenticating interpretation and any deployment of a truth content into history. We can approach the larger concept of divine violence in history for Benjamin first to the image of educating violence, which is unavoidable to some extent in any attempt by a teacher to lead a student out of doxa towards a truth content. Bocklet's comments like educating violence, divine violence might also be carried out among minorities prey to mythic violence and cannot, according to Benjamin, be grounded in law. In other words, divine violence is authorized by an ethic that has to account for its decisions only to God, like Kierkegaard's Night of Faith, or teleological suspension of the ethical and not to humanity. The examples given here are the violence of a general strike or of revolutionary and anarchist violence. This topic is too thorny for us to address here, but it's necessary to mention because for Benjamin, this divine violence is also apparent in the sovereignty of innovative artists, who break with an accepted definition of the work of art, and it's also visible in the ethic of the critic who challenges public judgment and anticipates aesthetic criteria that have not yet been established. The violence of the innovative artist or the insightful critic is for Benjamin a pure manifestation and release of the genius of humanity in its opposition to the forces of myth. And for Benjamin, society, alas, has no potential 
for rationality that the critic can rely on. The artist or critic, in other words, cannot rely on the ideal of communicative rationality as one shared by all agents in a deliberative democracy. This is a quite pessimistic vision. Recall Mallarmé's elitist judgment in response to criticisms of obscurity that the public is a many-headed hydra. Benjamin as well could here be accused of elitism and authoritarianism in his interpretations. On the other hand, he puts his finger on a very difficult problem here in regards to the present and future status of the work of art in a world where the public simply cannot be relied upon to in any way break with the forces of myth or of doxa. Benjamin thus notices the intimate link between poetic creativity and divine violence in the concept of a genius, which he borrows from Hedeline's depiction of Oedipus or Antigone. The genius of humanity designates a prophetic divine faculty by virtue of which we are able to escape destiny and attain freedom. Art and poetry are indeed the privileged locus of a salutary interruption and even a divine violence in the fatal course of things. Quote, it was not in law, but in tragedy, that the head of genius lifted itself for the first time from the mist of guilt, for in tragedy, demonic fate is breached. Pagan man becomes aware that he is better than his God, but the realization robs him of speech and remains unspoken. The paradox of the birth of genius in moral speechlessness, moral infantility, is the sublimity of tragedy. And it is probably the basis of all sublimity in which genius rather than God appears. He writes in his essay, Fate and Character. Rocklitz summarizes Benjamin on the task of the critic beautifully. A wall separates modern consciousness from both truth and tradition. Just as the image and the concept do not immediately have access to theological truth, the artist's technique does not immediately have access to the work's form or truth content. And just as modern beauty is dissociated from its anchorage in truth, modern freedom is cut off from its anchorage in tradition and ritual. Here, criticism plays a determinant role in crossing over that wall. It always holds the key to the enigma. Whether the enigma is truth or freedom, art or beauty, criticism is responsible for the founding values of culture. Where this privilege is tied to the fact that only criticism can act as a link between the image and the concept, the two aspects of a theological truth that has been split in two. The transgressive power of aesthetic criticism is exercised through the deciphering of the absolute in works of art. In terms of the language of such essay, the critic is the atom who makes every effort to name in conceptual terms what the artist named imperfectly through the figuration of his work. We've discussed now Benjamin's relationship to the general romantics, Goethe and Hödelin, but what about his relationship to the philosophy of art and aesthetics in Schelling and Hegel? Well, we've seen how, seeking to escape the aestheticism of the romantics, Benjamin defines the true work of art in terms of its truth content. Quote, yet there exist productions that, without being a question, have the deepest affinity to the ideal of the problem. Both philosophy and art have access to this truth content, but from different perspectives. Benjamin's early aesthetics is to be distinguished from art as the appearance of the absolute in Schelling and Hegel, because in those two philosophers, the truth of art was the truth of philosophy itself, translating art into conceptual terms, but on the same footing with it. For Benjamin, however, returning to Kant, doctrine, or true philosophy is beyond reach. And so for Benjamin, the authentic exercise of philosophy is limited to criticism, and in particular to aesthetic criticism, rather than truth being the domain of philosophy and beauty being that of art, and rather than the truth of art being merely reducible to the truth of philosophy, Benjamin speaks of an essential affinity of philosophy and art. Quote, the work of art does not enter into competition with philosophy, it simply enters into the most precise relation to it, thanks to its affinity with the ideal of the problem. Unlike Schelling, Benjamin considers philosophy incapable of formulating the idea of its own unity. In art, this same ideal of the problem is buried under the plurality of works, and the role of criticism is to extract it from them. Quote from Benjamin, in every true work of art, one can detect a manifestation of the ideal of the problem. And in this sense, Rooklet's comments, every work of art casts a messianic light on the fragment of reality it represents or on the artistic gesture itself. The fundamental question of art criticism is, does the appearance of the truth content lie in the subject matter or does the life of the subject matter lie in the truth content? In the work of art, the subject matter and the truth content become disassociated in the work and yet at the same time their precise relation determines the work's immortality or lack thereof. In this sense, the history of works of art 
prepares for their criticism, where the power of criticism to elucidate the subject matter in relation to its truth content in the work is always augmented by historical distance. On the limits of Goethe's own work, Benjamin speaks of anxiety as the price that mythic humanity pays for frequenting demonic forces, obviously thinking about Goethe's Faust. This mythic anxiety suffuses history as a whole and places humanity under the sign of the mythic eternal return and the phantasmagoria of modern consciousness. Humanity will be prey to a mythic anxiety to the extent that phantasmagoria of history occupy a place in it. There is for Benjamin no deliverance from this anxiety except redemption in eternal life. And on this point, Benjamin's later dialectical materialism did not change very much in these deep convictions, except that it invested all the qualities of religious eternity in the historical present, the now of action. In reaching the limits where Goethe, fascinated by the powers of myth, almost succumbs and betrays the imperatives of art, Benjamin, as he often does, turns to the philosophy of Hödelin as the surest guarantor of his own philosophy of art, and so we can speak of Hödelin's hidden reserve in Benjamin's philosophy of art and aesthetics. The reason defended by Hödelin bears the name, as we've seen, of Western or Junonian sobriety. Here, it is not simply the affirmation of the force of the idea, but the destruction of the aura that surrounds the beautiful appearance of myth. What Benjamin finds so perfectly expressed in Hödelin's Junonian sobriety, especially in the later works, is the ineffable or the inexpressive, the moment of mutism in tragedy, in Hödelin the sign equals zero or empty form of time that is the essence of the tragic, or it is this moment that demands a virtual raising of consciousness and that awaits the critic's explicit explanations. Closer engagement with Benjamin's Hödelin will have to be the subject matter of a future lecture. Benjamin can be seen as summing up his early aesthetic theories in his understanding of art and life as sublime. There is for him no artistic beauty that is not founded on the sublimity of truth. However, truth, the ultimate criterion of aesthetic validity, does not seem to be accessible except in an authoritarian and violent way, through an act of breaking and entering. And this is the reason that Benjamin defines aesthetic validity and truth not in discursive or analytic, but in theological terms. Benjaminian truth cannot convince, like the conscience sublime, it forces one's hands through its energy, through violent emotion, and through its claims to obviousness. And here we can speak of the early Benjamin's own limits. Citing Rocklitz, beginning with his philosophy of language, Benjamin is led to admit only one truth, despite the diversity of works of art, a truth that reveals the nature of mythic existence in relationship to which art and criticism play a therapeutic role. The radically sober, sublime truth of the early Benjamin has a dual status, radical disillusionment and radical authenticity. A work of art is aesthetically valid or successful here to the extent that it leads the reader towards that truth by destroying all beautiful appearances. For Benjamin, there is no properly aesthetic criterion for the value of art, nor as a result is there any place for a diversity of interpretations. The central truth that he wants us to recognize also monopolizes meaning. Nevertheless, Benjamin does not confine himself to a criticism founded on disillusion. He also makes an effort to redeem the appearance of the beautiful by linking the beauty of life to the beauty of art. And this is why Hödelin remains so important to him, for this is precisely what Hödelin's Hyperion accomplishes. Just as Goethe's elective affinities actuates a truth content beyond the mythic forces to which humanity is prey. On the question of Benjamin's relationship to Nietzsche, it's clear that the Nietzsche of the birth of tragedy is a constant interlocutor in his early thought. Although to what extent Benjamin reads and takes on board the Nietzsche of human all too human or the gay science is unclear. To be sure, the relationship between living beauty and sublime sobriety is modeled in part as a response to Nietzsche's notions of the Apollonian and the Dionysian. However, unlike the early Nietzsche who wished to liberate the Dionysian as itself the excess of truth, fully convertible in the marriage that is Greek tragedy into Apollonian appearance, Benjamin will emphasize the rupture between beauty and sublimity, form and content, or subject matter and truth content. 
Last up, before the intermission, we can note that messianic, if not luciferic, Benjamin is really not very far from Hegel in his thesis about the death of art, and even of the essential unity in decline of romantic and classical art, despite the necessity of disenchanting the beautiful appearances of art to reveal their sublime truth content, Benjamin acknowledges, as does Hegel, the legitimacy in the idea that the essence of beauty, its divinity, manifests itself in artistic appearance. Benjamin seems closer to Hegel here and far from the Nietzschean subversion of the Hegelian scheme. He remains faithful to a beauty founded on transcendental truth and to the theological grounds of aesthetics. What he gives up is the idea of providing an autonomous foundation to the aesthetic sphere, and this as well corresponds to the views of Hegel. In many respects, through the Goethean concept of the ideal of art, Benjamin returns to a conception of art and of the beautiful that conforms to the metaphysical tradition, and seems closer to Hegel than to any other major aesthetician of the 19th century. The paradox in his doctrine of positive criticism is that on the one hand, he tries to preserve the romantic intuition concerning the indestructibility of the work of art, thus attempting to save art from that sacrifice to philosophy or religion that you find in Hegel. On the other hand, Benjamin notes that romantic criticism sacrifices the work of art totally to the love of the cohesion of art itself. Benjamin's own critical project both enacts and suspends this gesture of the sacrifice of art, and this in a way agrees with and at the same time removes any possible finality from Hegel's thesis regarding the end of art. As Benjamin will later reflect, and as Hegel put it, only when it is dark does the owl of Minerva begin its flight, meaning here for Benjamin that only in extinction does the collector comprehend. The worlds of beautiful form or sublime truth that works of art open up to us are, in other words, a bit like Hegel's owl of Minerva, or Benjamin's own angel of history, a point we'll return to after a brief intermission. Have a nice break. Lastly, before turning briefly to Benjamin's The Work of Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction essay, no overall account of the early to middle Benjamin's philosophy of art would be complete without discussion of his distinction of allegory and symbol in his attempt at a second doctoral thesis or habilitation shrift, The Origin of German Tragic Drama. It's here that Benjamin attempts to break more decisively with romantic criticism noting that the renewal of the literary heritage of Germany, which began with Romanticism, has even today hardly touched Baroque literature. Roquelet's comments that this is a radical movement in Benjamin's approach, a new stage in his distancing from the Romantic aesthetic. Around this time, he wrote a short text, The Meaning of Language, in Tragic Play and Tragedy. Shortly after this, he was drafting his habilitation shrift. He might have become a professor and not a freelance writer and culture critic if this thesis had been accepted by his university committee. Even Horkheimer considered it too obscure. In The Origin of German Tragic Drama, Benjamin contrasts tragedy and tragic drama, tragedy being a form of ritual or cultic play, which completes, as Hegel taught, the death of old gods and the introduction of new ones through the mediation of the hero, while tragic drama for Benjamin, a modern phenomena, is devoted to the gaze of melancholia, for example, as Albrecht Dürer engraved it a century before the advent of that dramatic form. In turning to German Baroque drama, Benjamin was not holding these up as ideals of art in the Goethean sense. German Baroque drama does not afford the opportunity to study an immortal masterpiece, but rather a self-attuned artistic inadequacy and the trajectory of a truth content that does not achieve its consummation. Benjamin recognizes something of his own Judaism in the Christianity of Baroque drama. Above all, he uses this dissertation as an opportunity to critique the romantic doctrine of the symbol and to valorize in its place the agonal prophecies of medieval and Baroque allegory. Again, in Hegel, quote, tragedy presents a struggle between the ancient gods and the gods to come, a struggle in which the tragic hero is sacrificed. Tragedy is thus linked for Benjamin to prehistoric heroism, such as the Bronze Age mythologies, which ancient Athenians staged. But the Trauerspiel is something completely different, and testifies to the modern flight of the gods, the death of God, and an era of new religious ferment. At this point in his development, a philosophy of history is outpacing the philosophy of language as the organizing center of his philosophy of art and aesthetics. And it all hinges around Benjamin's new theory of allegory. Allegory, he says about this work, is the entity that it was my primary concern to recover. 
The aesthetic concept that mattered most to him during this period Brooklet's comments, this rehabilitation of the aesthetic concept of allegory has generally been considered the principal contribution of the origin of German tragic drama. And rightly so, since except for the later theory of the aura, this is Benjamin's most fruitful discovery in art theory and also the one to which he was most attached. He begins by underscoring the concealed polarity between profane symbol and sacred allegory. The allegorical form turns out to be a poetic response to the degradation that language undergoes in the instrumental conception that modernity gives it. Never before had Benjamin against the romantic aesthetic, which he had at first attempted to resuscitate. He criticizes it now for not being aware of the theological foundation of aesthetic concepts. There was, as we saw last week, a definitive movement in the romantic and symbolist aesthetic. We value myth and allegory, and even to argue that the symbol is some kind of higher form of the allegorical reflecting the marriage of sensible and supersensible in the moment, without however being dependent on the traditional allegorical interpretation of myth. The German idealists and romantics, as we've seen, rested their concept of symbol on the idea of a unity and a reconciliation between essence and appearance. The unity of material and transcendental object constitutes the paradox of the theological symbol, and this becomes distorted, according to Benjamin, into the relationship between appearance and essence. The introduction of this distorted conception of the symbol into aesthetics was a romantic and destructive extravagance which preceded the desolation of modern art criticism. As a symbolic construct, the beautiful is supposed to merge with the divine in an unbroken unity. This idea of the unlimited imminence of the moral world in the world of beauty is derived from the theosophical aesthetics of the romantics. From these observations, Benjamin begins his critique of the romantic symbol. For the Romantics, allegory was little more than the quote dark background, against which the profane concept of the bright symbol can stand out. Since the Enlightenment, mythic allegory tends to be seen as a mere mode of designation, a particular image to illustrate a universal idea, an allegoresis, or saying one thing by means of another, is a tale of old age to flesh out the image of an old man. In contrast, the symbol came to be considered as more authentically artistic, that is because it presents the universal in the particular, rather than like allegory, the particular is universal. This naive opposition of symbol and allegory, in terms of universal particularity versus particular universality, is according to Benjamin, the shallow concept of the symbol. And this because it tends to render the concept of allegory as dead or abstract. The heart of Benjamin's own distinction of symbol and allegory hinges on the relationship to time that each expresses. The measure of time for the experience of the symbol is the mystical instant in which the symbol assumes the meaning into its hidden or wooded interior. The symbol is the moment where the depth of meaning shows itself. It is the synthetic or synchronic moment and its dialectic moves between sensible and supersensible or appearance and essence. The allegory as well has a corresponding dialectic it is not the image of mystical fusion, rather of contemplative calm, the image of history, or diachronic myth which immerses itself into the depth that separate visual being from meaning. Allegory always has more meaning than the visual surface and in this sense is more authentically of the depths. As Benjamin frames it brilliantly, whereas in the symbol destruction is idealized and the transfigured face of nature is fleetingly revealed in the light of redemption, in allegory the observer is confronted with the Fasces Hippocratica of history as a petrified primordial landscape, the Fasces Hippocratica being the face that appears near death in some debilitating condition. Everything about history that from the very beginning has been untimely, sorrowful, unsuccessful, is expressed in a face or rather in a death's head. No wonder the beauty-loving romantics and symbolists were trying to get away from the allegory. It's just too pessimistic and disturbing in comparison to the fleeting hope of mystical union in the symbol. So symbolic art displays for Benjamin the transfigured instance and the beautiful appearance. Allegory, however, the dark or melancholic background of history and its sublime meaning. Retranslated into theological terms as Rochlitz notes, Benjamin's symbol and allegory are principles, again analogous to those that Nietzsche called the Apollonian and the Dionysian. For Nietzsche opposes the grace of beautiful appearance, the Apollonian, similar to Benjamin's symbol, to the horror of an ocean of sorrows, which echoes Benjamin's facies Hippocratica of history. But whereas the Nietzschean principles come together in Greek tragedy, 
In a kind of wedding or fusional horizon, Benjaminian allegory is radically foreign to the symbolic principle and cannot in any case be linked to it. Allegory represents a sublimity that is unfamiliar with the beautiful appearance, Benjamin here furthering his distance from the romantic concept of beauty. And thus Benjamin opposes Baroque allegory to all dominant traditions in philosophy of art and aesthetics, the Greeks, the Renaissance, German classicists and romantics. They all privilege beauty and its symbols. Deeper than the beauty of the symbol, wherever allegory picks up, its Midas touch turns everything into something endowed with significance. Its element is transformation of every sort. But this passion justifies a more recent linguistic practice whereby Baroque features are recognized in the late Goethe or the late Hudlin. Although it is itself still a symbolic form in the most general sense, allegory reveals the fragility of the symbol, its always provisional and momentary victory over the arbitrariness of the sign. For not only is allegory beyond beauty, but it perceives both the limits of beauty and a certain blindness in the eras of art that cultivated beauty exclusively. Here, allegory plays the role of the inexpressive or the ineffable, which according to Benjamin's essay on Goethe prevents appearance from becoming confused with truth. We still need beautiful appearance, however, since without it, art would remain desperately fixated on the image of the death's head, like the dead head of Orpheus we met in the French symbolists last week. Here, criticism no longer means paradoxical conflict between the indestructibility of the work of art, its eternity, and criticism as a sacrifice of the work to the idea or ideal of art, but in the context of Baroque tragic drama and the interpretation of its allegories, criticism comes to mean the mortification of the work. Not then, as the Romantics have it, awakening a consciousness in living works, but a settlement of knowledge in dead ones. Indeed, each time it reappears, allegories bear witness to the vitality of the pagan gods and becomes the word intended to exercise the surviving remnants of antique life. And so, with the revival of paganism in the Renaissance and Christianity in the Counter-Reformation, allegory, in the form of their conflict, had to as well be renewed. As was also the case for Baudelaire, allegory establishes itself most permanently where transitoriness and eternity confront each other most closely. This preference for allegory over symbol as the privileged symbolic form of art and sounds the theological aesthetic or biblical theme because it is mute, fallen nature mourns. Its mournfulness makes it become mute. The essence of the trauerspiel is already contained in the ancient wisdom according to which all nature would begin to lament if it were granted speech. The symbol can express a sudden transfiguring wisdom from the deep unconscious, but allegory is closer to mourning nature and better expresses the mourning within nature herself. In place of Nietzsche's pessimistic wisdom of Silenus, Benjamin touches here on a more ancient wisdom. What then is the relation between archaic allegory and modern subjectivity? For Benjamin, the Baroque analysis of the state of the creature is an unsurpassed description of the human condition, a retrieval of the archaic wisdom of mourning nature that is at the same time perfectly contemporary. In fact, the entire movement of allegory, like that of Baroque drama, consists in derealizing the pretensions of modern subjectivity. Subjectivity is like an angel falling into the depths and is brought back by allegories and is held fast in heaven, in God, by the mysterious pondering. As in Baroque music, any sadness on the part of the subject who isolates himself from the community, world spirits, and of God is submerged in a final allegro. And so for Benjamin, allegory represents a model of aesthetic authenticity beyond the Romantics, beyond Nietzsche, and classic German culture. The German Trauerspiel in the image of allegory is conceived from the outset as a ruin, a fragment. It pushes as far as possible the allegorical destruction of beautiful appearance and anticipates a radically negative aesthetics. Without the slightest compromise with the world, a calling for a final version only at the time of the Last Judgment. This form, the form of allegory, preserves the image of beauty to the very last. And there is more wisdom in Jean de La Fontaine's allegories, or in Aesop's fables, than in any romantic or symbolist hope to fix the moment of beauty forever. Transitioning now to the middle and later Benjamin, Chocolates notes that in the manuscript of the Paris Arcades, which we can't cover here, we find an aphorism, my thinking is related to theology, as the blotter is related to the ink. It is totally soaked in it, 
but if it were up to the blotter, nothing would remain of what is written. Rocklitz notes how Benjamin's grandiose construction opposes a Kabbalistic and ironic reinscription into tradition to Nietzsche's nihilism and the death of God, instead of redemption solely through aesthetic experience, such as Nietzsche's Dionysian intoxication or the romantic symbol, Benjamin believes he can outline an intact tradition that has remained untouched by modernity. This criteria for a theological gaze not only seems available to him, it even seems to impose itself in the theoretical construction of aesthetics, morality, social theory, and history. In fact, in reading the last text of Benjamin, Theses on the Philosophy of History, we realize the permanence throughout his oeuvre of certain theological ideas. It is nevertheless clear that all of Benjamin's thought cannot be reduced to this perspective. Inasmuch as they glimpse an imminent possibility of transforming the world, Romanticism and later Surrealism and Brechtian and Marxist political commitment represent the flip side and attempt to realize the possibilities of this earthly existence. Benjamin found in Surrealism, in Proust, Krauss and Kafka, Brecht and Russian cinema, a new perspective that overturned his philosophical position since he could not honestly call this art decadent. It is at this point that Benjamin flips and reverses his more traditional position that the work of art is enclosed in itself in its truth content. Art in the middle Benjamin becomes about action and function. Its addressee was no longer God, but the profane public marked by its struggling class consciousness. The search for revelation and redemption through art continued in this period, but now through revolutionary action and the reconciliation of technology with nature. The cult value or aura of language without addressee gave way to the exhibition value of a language that was seeking to awake and motivate. Benjamin enters this experimental and revolutionary Marxist phase and discovers the power of avant-garde art after reading Lukács' history and class consciousness and meeting with Astra Lassus, a Lithuanian woman of the theater and an enthusiast of Brecht and of the revolutionary scene in the USSR. As a freelance writer denied an academic career, he eventually became associated with the Frankfurt School and developed the views he's most famous for, historical materialism and his theories of the dialectical image. During this middle period, we could say the possibility of a Guthian sublime idol ends and Benjamin can be seen as sacrificing his earlier theories of art as he opened new vistas and adapted to a journalism career and sometimes to the Marxist tenets of the Frankfurt School. His last period returns to his messianic intuitions to a large extent, especially in his work Paris Arcades, Baudelaire and Theses on the Philosophy of History, and by the end the most famous image in all of Benjamin, the Angel of History, again closes the circle on Benjamin's philosophy of art and aesthetics. By 1939 he writes, this is how one pictures the angel of history. His face is turned towards the past, where we perceived a chain of events. He sees one single catastrophe, which keeps piling wreckage and hurls it in front of his feet. The angel would like to stay, awaken the dead, and make whole what has been smashed. But a storm is blowing from paradise, and it has got caught in his wings with such violence that the angel can no longer close them. This storm irresistibly propels him into the future, to which his back is turned, while the pile of debris before him grows skyward. The storm is what we call progress. There are a massive number of fascinating texts from the middle and later Benjamin we won't have time to cover here, but the text The Work of Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction might be considered the first text of Benjamin's last period, a kind of turning point between his middle and latest thought. The key most influential themes explored in this work are the aura, reproducibility, technological change and politics. Let's look at Benjamin's concept of the destruction of the aura first in his middle period writings on photography and film. A small history of photography four years before the work of art essay finds Benjamin first formulating his definition of the aura and the idea of its liquidation in the age of photography. What is the aura actually, Benjamin asks, to which he answers, a strange weave of space and time the unique appearance of semblance or distance, no matter how close the object may be. So wherever space and time come together in a strange weave, wherever semblance or distance, analogy or messianism appear in a unique configuration, there we find the aura. 
an aura which modern photography and film are now in the process of liquidating. The liquidation of the aura is what most of all provokes the crisis of art in general. In the age of technical reproduction, art and the aura does survive in modified forms as cinema, just as it survived dataism, but here by privileging cinematic shock effects. Benjamin's basic thesis regarding the crisis of the aura can be traced back to Hegel's death of art thesis. We are beyond the stage of reverence for works of art as divine and objects deserving worship. The intimate reflections and emotions that art now evokes require a higher test. This was philosophical science in Hegel, and it is political and pragmatic criticism in the later Benjamin. We can discern three main reasons for the destruction of the aura. One, the loss of aesthetic authenticity, which is opposed to mere artifice or technical reproducibility. Two, changes in the basic character of our ethical and political life, and the general democratizing of culture, which questions the privilege and the exclusive character of the aura. And three, there is the anthropological analysis that we have undergone a metamorphosis of perception outside of the indigenous mind that privileges the aura, for example, and moving in the direction of a primacy of the cognitive attitude. Brokelet's comments four years after the article on the history of photography, right in the middle of his work on Paris arcades, the work of art in the age of mechanical reproduction approached the theme of the aura from a much wider angle, this time clearly attached to the Weberian analysis of the disenchantment of the world. In the earlier photography essay, the concept of the aura was much more restricted and concerned with the halo characteristic of old photographs, which more recent industrial photography had attempted to reproduce through artificial means, much like we do now with filters on our iPhone. Here, the characteristic of the aura as a strange weave of time and space. Semblance or distance is completely removed from the concept of originality or singular uniqueness. The aura changes in being something that can be mass reproduced. No longer like in the earlier essay on photography is Benjamin concerned with the halo characteristic of old photographs. At issue now is the much less easily observable quality attributed to all art and stemming from its magic and religious origins. The theoretical ambition of the work of art essay is incomparably greater and hence the theses in its essay are much riskier. These considerations lead Benjamin to a reflection on authenticity of tradition. By 1935, the presence of the original is the prerequisite to the concept of authenticity. And this is a very thorny problem in more contemporary aesthetics indeed, just in Nelson Goodman's problem of the perfect fake. If you have two canvases, which are perceptually identical in every way, and only microscopic or spectral analysis reveals which is the original and which is the fake, then the only remaining concept of authenticity you can have to distinguish them is the one that Benjamin discusses here, defining authenticity in terms of the presence of the original. At this point, Benjamin notes prophetically that the whole sphere of authenticity, defined as originality, is outside technical and of course not only technical reproducibility. Confronted with its manual reproduction, which was usually branded as a forgery, the original preserves all its authority, not so vis-a-vis -vis technical reproduction. In other words, technical reproduction has achieved an era of such perfection that it has come to undermine the very concept of authenticity as originality. But why understand authenticity merely as originality? Rocklitz here points out that in opposing authenticity and reproduction, and Adorno was the first to notice this, Benjamin simplifies a more complex relation. In the essay on photography, the aura was due, in fact, to the technical conditions of photography. Now, in 1935, the concept of authenticity in being tightly weaved to originality refers exclusively to the notion of tradition. Quote, the authenticity of a thing is the essence of all that is transmissible from its beginning, which ranges from its substantive duration to its testimony to the history which it has experienced. And this is what we still value more in the original versus the perfect forgery. Nevertheless, through reproduction, what is disturbed is the authority of the object. That which withers in the age of mechanical reproduction is the aura of the work of art. Or in Benjamin's terms, one might generalize by saying, the technique of reproduction detaches the reproduced object from the domain of tradition. For by making many reproductions, the technique of reproduction substitutes a plurality of copies for a unique existence. And in permitting the reproduction to meet the beholder or viewer in his own particular situation, it reactivates the object reproduced. These two processes lead to a tremendous shattering of tradition, which is the obverse of the contemporary crisis and a renewal of mankind. What is noteworthy here 
is how revolutionary Benjamin's view is on the exotericism of mass culture and the fact that tradition now escapes authorized transmission. In the age of mechanical reproduction and its democratization of images, its ability to provide each and every one with tradition divorced from authenticity or originality, and to allow everyone to bring great works of art in fantastic reproductions into their home, the age of reproduction in fact renews humanity, but only at the cost of abandoning esoteric traditions. This may seem to be a good thing, but it's also for Benjamin a very worrisome thing. He is visibly ambivalent about this development and seeking to explore it. For in the entire previous history of art, as well as philosophy and religion, it is by remaining esoteric that tradition desires to be preserved. Whereas now tradition is liquidated to such an extreme degree that anyone can renew themselves through any aspect of it and even have vast libraries of what was once the most esoteric contents of philosophy or religion or art accessible on Google or cheaply available in some mass reproduced thing. Enter Benjamin on film. Here he notes that its social significance, particularly in its most positive form, is inconceivable without its destructive cathartic aspect. That is the liquidation of the traditional value of cultural heritage. And Benjamin here again fears that the generalized actualization of cultural heritage undermines tradition. It is not technical reproduction as such that represents a danger, but the possibility that it opens of exploiting cultural heritage merely for the ends of profit or propaganda that is outside traditional mechanisms of cultural transmission. And here Rocklitz introduces a criticism of Benjamin on film. The dividing line between preservation or renewal of tradition moves between different ways of interpreting transmitted works and not between authenticity and reproduction itself. And this explains why, how, in spite of the aura of actors who are present in person, theater can betray Shakespeare just as surely as can cinema. And likewise, film can renew the interpretation of Shakespearean drama. And sometimes it in fact accomplishes this, which is in these great film versions of Shakespeare's plays. However, Benjamin is still right here to a large extent. The fact that cultural heritage can be renewed in the age of reproducibility doesn't mean that it will be. The exploitation of cultural heritage merely for the ends of profit or propaganda completely outside of age-old traditional mechanisms of cultural transmission has indeed created a situation where the vast majority of films either simply break with tradition or liquefies it more or less completely haphazardly. The problem is the very one with which Benjamin begins his essay with an epigraph from Paul Valéry. We must expect great innovations to transform the entire technique of art, thereby affecting artistic invention itself, and perhaps even bringing about an amazing change in our very notion of art. In regards to these developments which Benjamin is diagnosing in the 1930s, the big question is how goes it with Marxism? And he notes regarding Marx's classic distinction of the base and the superstructure, that is the economic forces of production on the one hand, and the ideological universes through which they're by and large misunderstood and mythologized. This is a topic about which you can watch many other videos on YouTube, but notice Benjamin's point here. Theses on the developmental tendencies of art under current conditions of production in both the superstructure and the base or economy tend to brush aside a number of outmoded concepts, such as creativity and genius, eternal value and mystery, concepts whose uncontrolled and at present almost uncontrollable application would lead to a processing of data in the fascist sense. In other words, despite the truth of Marxist analysis of history and of contemporary to his own day Marxist aesthetics, what we are witnessing in the age of mechanical reproduction is not the messianic promise which the Marxist hopes for of a deep enough transformation in the superstructure that the base or economy comes to be transformed in a genuinely utopian mode. Rather, what we see is a twofold process. On the one hand, the complete death of classical art and its concepts such as creativity and genius, eternal value and mystery, and on the other, the uncontrolled flourishing of those very concepts in art as propaganda, and in the ultimate consequence of mass reproducibility, which is for Benjamin, the processing of data in the fascist sense. So Benjamin's ultimate task in the essay, the concepts which are introduced into the theory of art in what follows, differ from the more familiar terms in that they are completely useless for the purposes of fascism. They are, on the other hand, useful for the formulation of revolutionary demands in the politics of art. So let's now summarize some of the main points in the work. It begins with a reflection on ancient versus modern reproduction. In principle, Benjamin sets out in section one 
the work of art has always been reproducible. The Greeks could only produce on a large scale when it came to coins, terracottas, that is stencils, or molds like bronze. Everything else was unique, singular, and hardly able to be the basis of mass reproduction. Of course, the printing press changed all this and was the first mass reproduced art form. This familiar story underexamines for Benjamin the gradual formation of artistic reproduction through engraving and lithography. However, lithography was eventually surpassed by photography. It is in the photographic negative that in principle, infinite reproduction becomes quite easy. In time, the film, the stenograph recording, the sound film, and eventually, unbeknownst to Benjamin, the digital age. Benjamin's prophecy, which he finds in a sentence of Paul Valery, is still stunning today. Imagine thinking in 1935 or even earlier that just as water, gas, and electricity are brought into our houses from far off to satisfy our needs in response to a minimal effort, so we shall be supplied with visual or auditory images which will appear and disappear at the simple movement of the hand, hardly more than a sign. How soon after Benjamin wrote these words was there a television and eventually a remote control in every home, and now also laptops and iPhones. Indeed, since 1900, technical reproduction had reached a standard that not only permitted it to reproduce all transmitted works of art, it had also captured a place of its own among the artistic processes, that is, in the 20th century applied technological sciences, eventually giving us our laptops and iPhones. The question here is what effect all this was having and is still having on art in its traditional forms. For Benjamin in 35, what has changed is simply this. The reproduced work of art lacks a singular presence, a unique existence in time and space, just one where it happens to be. The cathedral leaves its locale to be received in the studio of the lover of art, for example through the phonograph, of course went the way of the 8-track, the tape, the CD, and nowadays Spotify. Under conditions of mass reproducibility, the choral production performed in the auditorium or the open air resounds in the drawing room. What has been depreciated and eliminated in the authenticity of the art object is, again, its aura. The infinite plurality of copies in new locales deprives of authentic wholeness self-shining the aura of the work of art in a singular consecrated place. And again, for Benjamin, film is the most powerful example of this loss of aura. Since for everything cinematic, only technical conditions of reproduction are what's required. Pure reproducibility has come to replace unique singularity. This accounts for Benjamin's concept of reproduction as a destruction of the aura. But notice reproduction doesn't destroy all facets and forms of the aura, at least not immediately. First sacrifice of the aura takes the form of liquefaction, the fact that art liquefies traditional values of a cultural heritage. And this is true of traditional art as well as mass reproduced art, they liberate flows into the social body. According to Benjamin, mass reproducibility increases these flows quantitatively, but also devalues and destroys traditions qualitatively. The film and other reproducibles replace the importance of cult centers as gathering points for art and even of museums, which must now catch up and as well liquefy their cultural assets, keep themselves relevant in the era of mass reproducibility. Indeed, in Benjamin's day, enthusiasts of the new reproducible will even claim totality, perfection, and sublation of all tradition. As if Shakespeare, Rembrandt, or Beethoven, were they alive today, would make films like the auteurs. And as if the new possibilities introduced by the new medium are properly messianic. For Benjamin, they are messianic in one sense, that is, as the democratization of images. They're a worrisome development in another sense, as a loss of the truth content of tradition. That is the flip side of the image, which has in all previous incarnations of philosophy, art, or religion, held the image in check. Benjamin here notes that from era to era, human perception does change fundamentally based on the kind of art mediums, auras, and cultures in which it is engaged. Nothing, however, has quite so quickly changed our mode of perception as this new era of mass reproducibility, especially the art of cinema. The desire to get hold of every desirable object at close range through art has abolished psychic distances and thereby the auras of art. Statistical analysis replaces the field of perception. Much of what we perceive in contemporary cinema is just such an application of applied mathematics. The sense of the universal equality of all things abolishes a field of differences, 
Why read books when we can just watch YouTube? We hear proponents of the new age of reproducibility proclaim all the time. What we have witnessed is an adjustment of reality itself to the masses and of the masses to reality. And this is for Benjamin a process of unlimited scope, as much for our thinking as for our perception. And these developments are very much in opposition to the close connection of art, ritual, and magic in traditional societies. Here Benjamin looks back to the beginning of art and notes that the earliest artworks originated in the service of ritual, first as magical, then as religious. In archaic art, aura is never separated from ritual function. Uniqueness and authenticity are based in ritual presence. And even in the secularized cult of beauty, such as the Romantics, unique presence is still everything. With the advent of reproducibility, however, political and economic purposes, propaganda and ideology completely engulf art. Art can no longer successfully defend itself simply with the dictum of art for art's sake. Under such social conditions, instead of being based in ritual or presence, art comes to base itself in politics. We can ask here if Benjamin's concern with esoteric tradition and transmissibility, and with the aura of traditional societies through early modernity, whether Benjamin is being fully fair, the possibilities inherent in mass reproducibility, must we see the historical process of desacralization as ineluctably leading towards a decline? both of art in the technical sense and of beauty. The ambiguities in Benjamin here are striking, such as when he writes, for the first time in world history, mechanical reproduction emancipates the work of art from its parasitical dependence on ritual. For Benjamin, according to Rocklitz, all artistic production, from the Renaissance to Mallarmé's pure art, falls under the Brechtian verdict, and gets stigmatized by this term parasitic, which implicitly assimilates all traditional art to the rubber print and artifice of denatured photography. Whereas Benjamin's severe judgment on the synthetic aura that characterized posed photography was well-founded, this global and hasty verdict on the metamorphosis of the ideal of beauty since the Renaissance is reductive and unfair. So what is Benjamin really up to in the work of art essay? According to Rochlitz, in 1935, he sacrifices beauty and the aura to the emancipation of technical reproduction as such. To an ever greater degree, the work of art reproduced becomes the work of art designed for reproducibility. There exists no original or authentic copy of the negative of a film, and from this Benjamin draws the radical conclusion that the instance the criteria of authenticity ceases to be applicable to artistic reproduction, the total function of art is reversed. Instead of being based on ritual, it begins to be based on another practice, politics. Here in Benjamin, politics and more precisely Marxist politics replaces the erratic domain and foundation of traditional art. It must be added that once Benjamin traced artistic autonomy back to the parasitical form of ritual, he had within his own premises little choice. However, the distinction he himself draws between the historical poles of cult value and exhibition value would theoretically at least have allowed him to escape the choice between the religious and the political. Benjamin did not pursue that compatibility, but in a peculiar manner, his sociological theory of art leads him to be interested not in works of art, but only in the social functions art as such fills in the age of mechanical reproduction, where such functions are no longer linked to the significance of a unique work. In a certain way, for Benjamin, at least in this essay, the medium is already the message, the significance of art is reduced to the medium through which it addresses the public. And since for Benjamin, the idea of the autonomy of art or art for art's sake is linked to the magical and religious aura, no longer has any raison d'etre or reason for being in the age of reproducibility, and now appears purely as illusory when the age of mechanical reproduction separated art from its basis in cult, the semblance of its autonomy disappeared forever, writes Benjamin. And so in this middle period, Benjamin, as in Nietzsche's work, the history of culture is traced back to the history of an illusion or a false sublimation. The Benjaminian reduction throws overboard both the ideological aspects of theology and idealism that he had earlier been so dedicated to, as well as the elements of a theory of specificity or truth content that were proper to his previous aesthetic logic. It is his argument about photography that leads Benjamin to these impasses. As he writes, much futile thought has been devoted to the question of whether photography is an art, the primary question whether the very invention of photography had not transformed the entire nature of art was not raised. Rochlitz argues with Benjamin here, it is one thing to transform the entire nature of art 
and another to set aside any aesthetic criterion in order to turn immediately to practical or political criteria. In the work of art essay, Benjamin no longer even asks the question of the aesthetic quality of works of art. Only the general role of cinematic technique in modern society interests him, such as when Benjamin writes, for contemporary man, the representation of reality by the film is incomparably more significant than that of the painter, since it offers, precisely because of the thoroughgoing permeation of reality with mechanical equipment, an aspect of reality which is free of all equipment. And that is what one is entitled to ask from a work of art. I don't think anyone would disagree that this still from a film noir is itself a work of art, which through, as Benjamin underlines, thoroughgoing permeation of reality with mechanical equipment liberates an aspect of reality we would not otherwise have seen. And this indeed is what we are entitled to ask for from a work of art. But is photography in the film really so important as to have brought about a complete destruction of the aura of all previous ages and eras? and a suppression of their truth content in favor of the form of reproducibility? Here Rochlitz speaks about where Benjamin went wrong. For cinematic technique as such has no more significance, artistic or non-artistic, than does the painter's technique. It all depends on what the artist makes of it. Otherwise, the industry of popular movies would be progress as such beyond modern painting, which is what Benjamin in fact unfortunately suggests, despite his reservation about purely commercial cinema. For Rocklitz, the opposition Benjamin sees between theater and cinema, between the here and now of the aura and its reproduction, is not ultimately tenable. For Benjamin confuses technical progress with the progress of art, and instrumental rationality with aesthetic rationality. Most of these objections, he notes, were made immediately by Adorno in the name of the critical rigor of the early Benjamin himself. In fact, the work of art essay, according to this analysis, stems from an ideology of progress that Benjamin himself denounces in later works. At this time, he saw his idea of the wind of history as blowing ineluctably towards technical development without remainder. As to where Benjamin went right in the origin of artwork essay, his observations are pretty prophetic and a little bit scary. The first version we read, Film's function is to train man in his apperceptions to form in him new reactions under conditions of mechanical equipment, equipment whose role in our lives is increasing almost daily, to make the immense technical apparatus of our age the object of human innervation. That is the historical task in which the true sense of film resides. Which means sounds here almost like an avatar of transhumanist progress. What happens with the loss of the aura and the domination of the screen is that the critical and receptive attitudes of the public come increasingly to coincide. The film responds to the shriveling of the aura with an artificial buildup of the personality outside the studio. The cult of the movie star fostered by the capital of the film industry preserves not the unique aura of the person, but the spell of personality, the phony spell of a commodity. In other words, whichever pill we take, the red one or the blue one, in the new matrix of mechanical reproducibility matters little. The capitalist algorithm of all the apps on our iPhone will still direct our perception either way. I think my favorite observation in Rocklitz's analysis comes when he points out that the work of art in the age of mechanical reproduction essay may be the most extreme form of nihilism in the economy of Benjamin's oeuvre. These themes of the decline of the aura, the liquidation of tradition, and the disappearance of the human are the expression of a fundamentalism that expects redemption to come only out of the ruins of false and illusory reality. The work of art essay is, in other words, one of Benjamin's messianic experiments, and fully understandable in light of his dictum that nature is messianic by reason of its eternal and total passing away. To strive after such passing, even for those stages of man that are nature, is the task of world politics whose method may be called nihilism, Benjamin himself writes in theological political fragments. To those who, like Sholem or Adorno, disapproved of the work of art essay, Benjamin responded that he had sacrificed the aura because that was the only way to remain faithful to the theological issues of art, to a mode of thinking to which art offers an essential knowledge. If that theology of catastrophe was not enough to legitimate artistic modernity, then according to Roglitz, we must also abandon the concept of the aura and explain in some other way the magical effect of certain works of art. In closing, Benjamin's work of art essay is itself an act of Abrahamic sacrifice. Thankfully, God stayed art's execution 
Benjamin himself realizes in his later writings as he increasingly comes to the defense of Hart. I suppose we could say that in 1935, Benjamin attempted to sacrifice Hart, but the angel of history showed up and said, don't kill Art, Benjamin, at which he was quite relieved. The issues pointed out by the work of Art essay are, however, especially timely in an era where mass-reproduced Angel of History tote bags are widely available on the internet and Benjamin finger puppets, no less than golden tickets, promising to admit one progress to be found in this storm. Meanwhile, real Angels of History continue to circulate in a world in need of reading Benjamin more than ever. Thanks for your attention to this long lecture, and I'll be giving the five best student-generated memes using this image a 1% boost on your final grade. Have a good week, everyone, and see you next week.